All right, we have a packed audience. Great. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Narendra Narang. Uh, I'm one of the solution architects for, for, uh, for Red Hat with a focus on Telco. Um, and I also want to quickly introduce Sanjay and Ian. Uh, all Hi. right, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Ian Hood. I'm the uh, chief architect for the uh, Telco Vertical and uh, joining my, uh, my colleague here, Narendra. Hi, I'm Sanjay Aigari, senior solutions architect for Telco Vertical. So again, welcome. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today and is, is you know, just, just a collection of thoughts and ideas uh, you know, from working with customers and some of our experiences. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a topic um, that is actually very close to you know, everything that we do today in terms of watching content uh, over, over the network. And uh, the title we came up with is basically Taming the Tantrums of, of Choppy, Jerky, Laggy Video. And the, the reason we have, uh, we have all these, we've, you know, these, these terms in here um, of, of misbehavior are because that's exactly how, or this is exactly how uh, some video sometimes or content delivery sometimes behaves. Um, you know, so how many of us in here have uh, a mobile device and uh, you know, we, we want to play something and we always experience uh, an issue and we, we experience that annoying little buffering, right? So what we're going to be proposing here is some of the, the thoughts behind why that occurs and how we aim to, uh, to address some of those issues. So the first thing I want to talk about is, you know, we talk to a lot of our customers. We talk to folks like yourselves. And the first thing that, that we encounter is uh, Red Hat and content delivery. Um, you know, how do the two relate to each other? How, how do you, you know, what does Red Hat have to do with, with, uh, with, with, this, with this topic at all? And why are we even here talking about this? So as you know today, that, that open source is, is ubiquitous, right? And it's, and it's all about how we can deliver some, you know, everything that you see here, these, these, uh, these terms in terms of uh, having a very malleable, flexible uh, architecture. Um, it's about how we can address the needs of not only le uh, legacy, but also how we can evolve into, uh, to deliver, well, actually traditional, uh, a lot of the traditional content over new modes of, of, of uh, delivery. Uh, but then also addressing the new formats for this delivery. So things like, um, you know, as we evolve from 4K and Ultra HD to 8K, and even things like uh, virtual reality. Um, and then it's about encountering, as you deliver these services, as you encounter issues of quality and, and you know, just delivering the best quality of experience to the end user. So with that, you know, all of us have experienced, as I mentioned, some, you know, some of this to, to some extent, which is um, you, know, you expect to see the screen on the, on the left. You, know, you don't want to sit down with your family and you want to watch a movie on a Saturday night. And you expect to see that high definition, seamless transport. Um, and what we get often is um, what you see or observe on the right, that little buffering ring. right? And that basically is, is quite annoying. Um, and, it, and it's very evident from the statistics that you'll see here, which are based on the, the startup time. So basically anything less than, or anything greater than six seconds of startup results, and, and these, are, these are statistics that have been provided to us you know, by a lot of the, the providers, right? The, uh, the media providers or, or the major media providers. So uh, you know, this isn't just some, some point of conjecture or something we've just pull out of thin air, these are actual real statistics. And you can see that they're very real because anything greater than six seconds of startup results to a loss of audience, right? And that's not good because especially when you're trying to deliver content and you're trying to monetize that service, that's a problem, right? Because the, the less or the more you lose your, your audience, the less subscribers you have to that content and essentially to your service. And then there's, a, there's an exponential increase in um, that as, as you experience that delay and it, as it goes to, to greater than 10 seconds, you'll see that about 50% of your viewers are lost. And then you'll also see that even with a 1% buffering of video, you're going to experience about 5% of, of loss of your viewers. And you know, we typically, um, so they've been characterized, uh, or, or, or some of the reasons have been characterized um, in one of these sort of domains, which are, you know, the it, whether it's bit rate or whether it's the resolution of video that's being or content that's being delivered or the frame rate, the frame rate or even, even picture quality. So having established the, the, some of the challenges here um, and in terms of also addressing 
you know, why, why we're here today and the topic we want to talk about, I'm going to hand it off to, to Ian to talk about why we experienced this. Okay. Thanks. All right. So, we'll so, and so I guess, you know, so why does this actually happen? So, you know, it's pretty obvious that, you know, the dedicated networks that have been built for our homes and everything else were designed for this, or at least reasonably well, but you know, it wasn't really designed, the internet, to actually handle the streaming in real time. And if I could go over the top with video, whether it's Hulu, Sky, Netflix, any of those, I want to be actual to deliver this experience. And unfortunately, the ability to do this with standardized and accepted prioritization mechanisms, they don't actually exist. And that's kind of one of the reasons that we're here as to how do we actually take these things we're talking about and standardize them, again, take that open source thing to it. So the real simple picture you see there is that if everything's running beautifully, right, all things are going, you know, at a very specific rate. But what happens is if the delay isn't consistent, therefore we have jitter, that's actually much more important. Now things come at different times, and now not only to have video drops and things of that nature, but because video has very specific packets in it and actual control information in it, if I lose an important packet, I don't just lose like a little pixelation on the corner, I lose the whole thing, <laughs> right? And then on top of that, when that starts to happen, then I get overflow situations, and as a result of that, now I get the rebuffering and things are spinning, and, you know, and my son has already you know, left the room. <laughs> and he's, uh, okay, I'm done with that. And that's the other thing is that you know, as we you know, look at what people are ex thinking as acceptable, this is really an important issue for us. And so these are the things that actually you know, get in the way of what we want to do. So what happens when we re retransmit pockets? We drop them. Um, then we end up with shared media situations where I'm sharing it you know, in, uh, in cable environments. Um, a real issue for us is, as we look at higher definition, we'll see in a minute, is how long does it take for the actual round trip, you know, for the data to get back and forth, and then what's the delay in things of that nature, how we actually deliver this. So this ability to deliver you know, packets in a very consistent form needs to be standardized because at the moment, you know, it's a very complex system to actually build, and you can't kind of change things on the fly. So as I said, what happens with real you know, round trip times? So this is a real issue for us. So they've actually gone out and measured if I decided to try and actually try and deliver UHD, um, if I'm more you know, than 20 milliseconds, right, I can't actually deliver um, 4K UHD. So I actually can't do it. So since I do that, we start seeing this rebuffering and those kinds of things. So as we move to this higher definition and virtual reality, I've really got to bring that time in, which we all know there's different ways to kind of solve this, and we'll get to that in a sec. The next one up is let's take about how much bandwidth this stuff actually takes to deliver. So over the course of time, we've gone through you know, standard def, one, two, three, four, and they've slowly you know, started to chew up more bandwidth. Then we get to sort of the first high def, you know, and we're kind of in that you know, six to eight megabits per second. But look at the bottom of the list here, is that we end up with 24 just for one stream. And this creates a significant you know, doubling of requirements, both in storage, et cetera, and on top of that, that issue of the round trip times to deliver. And another thing, people think that, okay, well, why don't I just, you know, I'll just ingest it once, and they just send a single stream at a time. Well, that's nice if it's the, the lower speed ones, because I can get that in fairly quickly. But the UHD itself, is taking you know, more than all of them together anyway. So we gotta solve this problem, even if it's not just for EHD. So I'm gonna hand this back to uh, Narendra, and he's gonna talk about, okay, so let's really see how bad you know, this is happening over the course of time in the actual network here in North America. Right, thanks Ian. So, you know, and, and, and this pretty much says, says it all, right? So we, we, we've understood, or we've, we've got to a point where we understand where, where this congestion is, is coming from. Uh, but these are some, some actual statistics, right, over the course of the, the, the past two years. Um, and I, I want to just, you know, walk through this a little bit because, um, you know, if you, look, if you look at the top chart, there, there's a couple of differentiating factors between, between what's displayed on top and at the bottom. So let's focus on the top for a moment. The top is mainly, so they're, they're, both, um, they're both distributions of uh, peak period traffic, but one's for fixed access and one's for mobile access, right? So, so first differentiator. But while focusing on the top, you'll see that it's also, there's also a distribution, um, 
and these are aligned by by year on year traffic right so there's there's 2015 through 2016 so you can clearly see uh, this distribution um, as, as we're moving forward in time. Uh, and then I'll also share with you some interesting results that we were looking at this morning um, as, we, as we move into 2020. Um, and, and actually, you can, you can actually obtain that uh, from, from some public uh, domain information. But um, this is upstream traffic in the first two columns, and then you can see the downstream traffic. So this is actually, you can clearly see how it's exhibited here, right? In that, in that big red bar where it's, it's demonstrated that a lot of that traffic is us you know, consuming that content, right? It's, it's the stuff we're watching you know, OTT over the top. It's, it's all about the OTT services. It's the Netflix, the Hulus. Uh, it's all the other content that we're downloading from and, and watching uh, you know, via YouTube. And then you can see all the other types of traffic, whether it's communication or gaming or web browsing. And you can see you know, the internet, what, what started off uh, you know, with, with everyone consuming it for web browsing, you can see what a small portion or a slice that's actually being consumed just for web browsing. It's almost negligible. Um, so this is part of the problem, right? And in, when, it, when you talk about fixed access, and then you look at mobile access, you can see the same phenomenon, right, over here as well, that this is the type of upstream traffic, and you can see even the upstream traffic, right, even on mobile devices, this is the types of content where we're recording on our phones as we're moving around and we're mobile and we're uploading it. So, you know, there were some interesting studies that, uh, that uh, we, we found in, a, in some, some Ericsson studies where uh, the volume of upload traffic is, is gradually uh, or almost to the point where it's going to overtake the amount of or the volume of downstream uh, traffic. And, and that's a huge problem, right? So not only do the devices have to keep up, which is what we're seeing, but it's also the, the, the traffic or the volume of traffic as an aggregate that's going to grow. Um, and then I'll let Ian quickly share some of the statistics we found uh, this morning as we move into 2020. Yeah, so what, what I found uh, this morning was that um, I've looked at some of these studies a few times, and effectively the traffic that we have monthly you know, is in the exabyte, so that's like 10 to the 18 kind of numbers on a monthly basis. And if you took you know, the sort of you know, 40 million of us, you know, all day, all the time, for an entire year, yeah. you know, downloading a UHD video simultaneously, so it took you know, a pretty large population, that's how much traffic is actually going you know, monthly here in North America. And you know, I'm looking at these charts, and one of the things that I'm sort of expecting is that, A, the size of these graphs in aggregate would be larger, and as you said, Narendra, the key thing that's gonna start to happen is that that upstream number is actually gonna come up as we see that our, our kids are sharing more things and you know, Periscope is in and all these ways that I can do FaceTime live from, from anywhere, this is 2016 data. So that's actually a little dated already. Right. Right? So that's the thing about, you, know, you look at data, you gotta project where it's gonna go. And so that's kind of the thing we're seeing there you know, with the data that's out there. Okay. Um, and just one last thing I wanna quickly share here uh, before I hand it off to, to, to Sanjay here, is um, you know, Netflix, who's one of the premier providers, as we all know, of, of content, but also high definition content, um, agrees, right? So just, you know, uh, there were some, there were some um, comments made by Reed Hastings, CEO of Netflix, uh, you know, at Mobile World Congress um, this year, and then also last year at, um, uh, I believe it was at, at CES. And some of, you know, these are some of the, some of the comments, uh, you know, you can just read through them. I'm, I'm not gonna read through them, but the idea is that, you know, you can actually go to those links, um, you know, the presentation will be shared, but you can watch them and you can, and he talks about specifically what we shared in our first slide, which is even Netflix has not been able to get rid of the buffering problem, right? The premier content provider, right, OTT provider has been not been able to address the buffering problem. They will at some point, Right, and you know, just along with, with the rest of the, of, of the providers, but they have not been able to address it. And there are some severe challenges as to why, and, and some of those will be, you know, will be discussed uh, here. So with that, um, you know, I just wanna talk about the, um, some, of the, some of the challenges, right? So we know why it's happening, but these are some of the, the challenges uh, that are being faced by these, by these providers. Um, and I've sort of split them up into this, this multi-dimensional uh, space because I want to I want to be able to separate them out. Um, the first, of course, is you know we always attribute things to to technical challenges, right? But they're not always technical. 
There's also issues with, with operations, and there's also issues with economics, right? Does it make sense? Is the market, is the timing for delivering this type of content and the geography in which I'm distributing the content, is it suitable, right? Is it the right time for me, for me to release this, release this service? If I release this service, how do I scale? If I scale, will my, will my supply of my services meet the demand of my customers? Will the customer demand even exist a year from now, right? At the pace at which technology and, and delivery services are being, are, are evolving. So very quickly, um, you know, it's about content licensing. So it's, it's about creating this equilibrium, right, of, uh, and, that, and that balance of, infra of, of infrastructure and sort of offsetting the, the investment with the, the cost of, well, what's coming in, right? I'm charging for the service. Am I going to be able to offset it, offset it with um, my subscription costs and my ad revenue? The new services, what type of new services can I offer? Um, and then how can I create a model whereby that's justifiable, where the declining cost of hardware can be factored into the cost of my solution? And then time to market, as I mentioned, right? Is the time for releasing the service right? Is it ripe for me to go out and grab the subscribers, right? How much market share can I actually gain? And then things like regulatory. Right, so some of you in this room who are here are, are familiar with some of the regulatory issues and about shared content and how that content can be, you know, the governance of that content, right, for, due to, to DRM, to digital right management issues. Um, and then also the type of content and where it's stored and whether it's a shared versus a unique type of copy. But at the bottom are more some of the, the attributes that are closer to our hearts, right, the operational aspect of things and the technical aspect of things which are, you know, when I start to deliver this at scale, I need a degree of automation. I need a high degree of automation, right? So gone are the days when I have, um, you know, for each asset on my data center floor or my infrastructure, I start to manage this with, with as many people, right? That model simply doesn't exist. And then how do I upgrade it and how do I evolve it over time? And then I need to be able to collect all the analytics from this infrastructure so I can make it more efficient. And I also need to evolve the skill sets and, and be able to train my, my force, my workforce, to be able to keep up with this type of architecture. And then be able to monitor and remediate the problems and be able to troubleshoot them very, very rapidly. And then last but not least, some of the technical issues, right? The scale and elasticity of the services, the actual infrastructure, uh, the performance, the bandwidth and the quality of experience, because the quality of experience is gonna decide how much how you get to keep your customers, if you get to keep your customers, and how much you can charge for your service. And then also being able to accommodate the, the capacity of this content or the storage capacity of this content very, very efficiently. Um, and then more efficient use, for example, of the radio network. So being able to, at the edge, being able to deploy certain services which can take, a, a, a take or make uh, or leverage some of the uh, services at the edge to make your content delivery and your cell towers more, or the use of those cells more efficient. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Sanjay to discuss um, and talk about some of the traditional versus the new architectures. Uh, thank you. Um, so when we look at the um, traditional way that content was delivered, the question becomes um, that looks good, okay, I have a content provider, I distribute it to a cache, I go over a telco network and the customer has a set-top box that receives it. So what's the problem with this? Well, all of this depends on three things. You know what content you're delivering, you know when you're delivering it, and you know where you're delivering it, right? You know that it's, you know what program, you know you have a file for that, you know that you're sending it at a certain time, and you know it's going to a certain set of residential houses at, you know, in certain neighborhoods. Well, once you cut the cord, all that is gone. You have no, no longer any assumptions. What content? Well, people consume any of, you know, millions of programs of streaming. Wait, when? Any time, right? Uh, and maybe they may even consume it in chunks at different times. And where? Mobile, right? I mean, it's on your phone. So, um, you know, where you're locating the storage has to be very flexible. It can't be only in, in one place. In fact, you know, the residence may not be the best place to store it, right? 
or near the residence may not be the best place to store it. It may be a minority of the content consumption. That's what's starting to happen. So all the assumptions made in the building of these networks are turning out to be old fashioned. So we need to change. So, so when we, so, um, when we look at um, the results of this, we have to move from this type of environment where um, everything is sort of, uh, sort of centralized um, and you know, to, to a more modern environment. So what does that mean? Well, we need to have some data around how well the video is being delivered, what kind of device it is, and uh, you know, what happens when you pause and rewind and all those types of things. And these are challenges um, with a streaming environment. So the, the first, thing, first thing you want to do is to actually uh, you know, relocate um, your caches in different parts of the network. It's not, it's not centralized. And you see this with the main content providers. You see you know, Netflix, Amazon, Google. They're, do, they're all doing this. But today, it's essentially a siloed stack. So if you're not one of those providers, if you're one of those providers, you have your own servers, you have your own content caches, and even content cache hardware that you install, um, and you have your own clients that you write for every uh, client device out there, whether it's everything from mobile phones to TVs to whatever. So if you are in, if you have that silo, if you invest in that much, you can actually do this. But if you're not one of those providers, and let's say you you have a license to a lot of great content, well, guess what? You may not be good at those other elements, and then you're not going to be able to deliver the quality of experience. So. Um, and that's, that's a really uh, difficult problem. Why is it difficult? Well, I'll tell you that you know, the NBC app on the Roku like, constantly crashes, whereas Netflix doesn't. So you know, if you want to watch uh, Saturday Night Live, um, sorry. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's not a good experience. And that, that's my experience, right? Because you know, they're, not, they're not a software provider. They're, you know, they're, they, they don't, that's not their focus, right? So, so these are these are the kinds these are the kinds of things that um, you know we we would like to get to a more horizontal environment where there are standards and content providers can deliver their stuff, content caches can do their thing, and end users at the edge can use the clients of their choice. But that means these communication mechanisms can't be uh, proprietary. So the other the other things that that we need to do um, in, in this kind of environment is to do some sort of, have some sort of intelligence in terms of what's being, like what type of device it's being consumed on to transcode, um, uh, transcode and deliver the resolution that's appropriate for the end user so you're not delivering ultra HD when the device can't consume it. Um, that makes that creates a lot of control logic and control paths that go back and forth that need to be negotiated. So this is a a, a uh, interesting topic. So um, so as we as we move to more mobile edge computing environment, uh, we have more options to move uh, content out towards towards the edge. Um, so. Um, when we get so some of the benefits of, of doing this are that you know we can massively reduce the bandwidth and solve some of these some of these problems that we that we've talked about, um, and we're going to talk about now uh, some details around the um, orchestration mechanisms which are necessary to make this happen because um, you know it's not fixed anymore as I said if you have to. If you're doing place shifting and you're watching on one device and you want to continue watching on another device, well, unless, unless again, you're playing in the same ecosystem, if, if the new device has, say, a generic app, there better be some standards for the handoff. So with that, I'll uh, pass.
pass it over to Ian to talk about uh, some of the capabilities here. Yeah, so uh, the, uh, you know, so some things that we can actually, you know, do since we've got sort of some additional capabilities from different vendors that come up with, you know, um, software flexibilities to deliver this, you know, stuff at the edge, um, we still can't forget even, you know, the networks themselves have to be built such that I can actually deliver this multicast traffic, even though it's going to be, we all think it's going to be unicast forever, um, I'm going to want to have, you know, that kind of capability to optimize that bandwidth. Um, we want to take care of this round trip uh, uh, time, and we want to actually make it so that, you know, we all know that, you know, I'd like to watch this, my son would like to watch that, my daughter would like to watch this, but even as a, as a family or as a group, you want to kind of pick and personalize your, um, your content. So if I haven't got a software way to kind of do that from the portal and actually choose that content, that becomes an issue for us. And, you know, gone are the days when I can say that, okay, I'm going to lock up these radio channels on the, on the broadcast line for cable, and that's all I've got to work with, right? We want to be able to actually know how much I need for this, as uh, Sanjay said, you know, taking the transcode off of this device, I've got to move it from my TV to my, you know, my iPad or to my mobile device, and then I've got to be able to walk out the door and not have it actually, you know, stop in the middle of it, because I want to be able to take this and, and see it there. So that's where we want to have that flexibility for those handoffs and truly be able to kind of take care of this, not just for the content, but the control channels that are going on um, in the radio networks, because they're going to be on Wi-Fi for a bit, switch to another Wi-Fi, uh, same device, diff or sorry, different device, um, same Wi-Fi. I'm going to switch over to LTE as I leave. Well, how does that actually get negotiated and hand handed off? We see that all the time right now. You know, if we're in meetings and we're trying to do that, you know, the meeting cuts off and I've got to come back in, right? And we've got to make sure this is truly modular because it really is all about economics, right? I can't really do this. Now, we've seen with the set-tops that, you know, the truck roll to go swap your set-top because that, that's what goes on right now. Is if something goes, you know, goes bump, the code's not working, um, what do you do? You go down to the local store and, you know, hand them back your set-top box, you get another one. Well, they want to be able to change this stuff on the fly and make it, you know, economically viable for themselves because that's really their big cost is their ability to deliver that, and we got to take that, you know, technology we've got, you know, sort of in the cloud side and push it as far as we can out to the edge of the network because that's where really all the costs are. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to you, my friend, and we'll talk about where we're going next. Yeah, sure. So, so one of the things that um, one of the things that the uh, you know, really good content providers do today is they, they have a mechanism to feed back information from their clients as to how well the video is being delivered so that then they can make adjustments on, on the video delivery. So, for example, if you turn on, I mean, there, there's some, if you get, it's a nice experiment you can do. You, you get, find an old DVD player you know, from the early days of Netflix integration of DVD, and those apps had um, debug modes that you can turn on. You can see, like, as the video streaming, what's the uh, rate and, and, and all that. And I have one of these. I have an old uh, Panasonic. And Netflix is really good at making sure all of their apps going all the way back, they always work. So, um, you know, they don't uh, deprecate them. So, um, and you can see that they'll do some interesting tricks, like um, when they start streaming, they'll start at a lower resolution because they can get it to you quickly because that six second mark, they know that as well as so everybody knows that. They said, what are we gonna do about it? We're gonna make sure it starts before that six second mark. <laughs> so, you know, so it would be a lower resolution, but guess what? That's like the credits or whatever, right? So, and then, then they refine, then they, once, they real, once the slow start in TCP gets to the right point, then they switch and they switch to a higher bandwidth and you get, and, and you get um, a better resolution and things start, you, you know, they're reasonably good once you, once you get to, the, once you get to the, uh, the program going. So, you know, very quickly you learn that, no, don't fast forward five minutes into it to skip the credits because, you know, you, you actually want slow start to <laughs> get through, get through the, the point. So they do a pretty good job, but again, it's proprietary, right? So how do we bring that to a more open environment where, you know, it would be great if, um, if we took advantage of, you know, some of the open technologies we have to drive uh, some standards in terms of, you know, what are the messages for um, bandwidth, um, 
uh, bit rate and resolution shifting that should happen, right? I mean, nobody's really driving those kind of standards, and, and, and I think because Red Hat has open um, interfaces, op you know, not only just open source, but we really stand behind uh, open interfaces between components, and we try to participate in that kind of environment. Um, this is an area where um, there's a lot of value in having these open interfaces and where they are, are not there today. So it's, a, it's essentially um, sort of a, in some ways, a new market for OpenStack to be involved in um, and really promote that openness. Um, so if we, if we look at um, the, 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 other, the other thing that's really important is, is that um, we, do this in a way that's very efficient because there's not a lot of processing left over after you're doing transcoding and all of these things to have some complex integration software, right? So with that, I'll talk about, um, I'll talk about a so-called overall architecture. Um, you know, the NFBI uh, platform to deliver the networking functions, obviously, um, running on OpenStack. There are a lot of other control operations which we'll talk about, but one of the things I wanted to really focus in on, which is, which would be sort of a new thing, is some basic functions that are needed, uh, that need to be standardized in order to make sort of um, open video successful. Um, very simple, bitrate shifting, it needs to be a standard way of bitrate shifting. Can we work on that in the industry? Um, pause, rewind, fast forward, most basic things. This is an area where we've, over the last 30 years, we've gone backwards in technology. If you remember the VCR, you hit rewind instantly. You can, if you miss the joke, you get it again. Now, DVDs, you hit rewind, it took you like, Okay, very blocky, then you finally get back, and you probably have to rewatch the last minute of content to get to where you missed. Streaming, you hit rewind, uh oh, buffering. <laughs> You're gonna rewind. you know, very quickly you don't know, you know what? I'm not I'm never gonna rewind. I'm never you know, it's it's like back to the days of TV without VCRs or anything. Like everything's live, okay, you, you don't get to see anything again, sorry, because the buffering is so bad if you rewind. So what we've really got to do is, you know, if there is just some control messages that could go back to the content cache that said, hey, rewind was hit, just move your pointer back, you know, everything would be fine. You don't need to rebuffer from the beginning of the stream and then do a seek again and then find it and then find the keyframe. That's what they're doing today. So this, is, this would be a really interesting mechanism to feedback. And, um, you know, there is a lot of work going on today in terms of, um, in, in terms of uh, real-time control. We're doing this in many other areas. Uh, we could do this in video. Uh, as well, the other area is, is of course, um, the telemetry data from the end, uh, the clients. Um, why does that have to be proprietary? Uh, an open client should be able to report its uh, frame rate with an open mechanism. So uh, with that, um, uh, I just want to take a you, brief. Yeah, you want to talk I'll, about I'll, the other? I'll just yeah, grab a couple, of, a couple yeah, of points there. Sure. So you know, as we looked at this architecture, you know, we know we've got to push things out to the edge to try and you know, mm -hmm. optimize things. So that's, that's one piece of it. But in addition to that, everything's been sort of been done at the head end, which is, you know, which is good, and I kind of move things around there. And we've got to look at that, you know, how do I deliver it to the edge? So as we take a look at you know, that, you know, those things I want to do out there, I'm constrained, you know, in the actual you know, radio networks themselves, right? Because we're, you know, we're saying this is all going mobile. So there's a number of um, different um, vendors that are actually looking at how do I optimize not just, you know, the traffic in the head end, because that's how we've done it for years. You know, I've had all kinds of different technologies that sit behind the packet core that optimize TCP buffering and do video optimization, and that's kind of the things we've been doing. Right? Now we've got actually ways that I can do this, not just in the IP streams, because if I do it there, that doesn't actually solve the problem 
for the actual radio waves that are out there that we're actually trying to utilize. So there are vendors out there that are saying, okay, why don't I take a look right inside those and see what's going on there and optimize streaming content video at the very edge of the network. And depending on who you talk to, it's a variation on, some people call that cloud RAN, and some people call that cloud air, because I'm actually optimizing out, out to the air interfaces themselves. Um, but there is, again, a software module that is going to be you know, open source and made available to us that I can actually do some of these things that uh, Sanjay was talking about so that we can have the experience we want um, anywhere that we ta happen to take it. So it's really kind of taking that functionality we had kind of out here centrally and found that it didn't really scale, didn't distribute, didn't get it down to the narrow level that I wanted to it and have that granularity for everybody, especially since I'm changing devices on the fly, networks on the fly. It's not just the video content. It's actually the control information that does the handoffs between the network. So we expect this to seamlessly go from here to there and not miss a bit. All right, that's kind of what we expect. So back to you, to, and render. We're almost out of time. I just really want to quickly tie this back into the four principles that I brought up there for our architecture, which are economic and uh, technical, as well as operational. And you can see what's demonstrated here, right? This is, not, this is more than just a pretty diagram with some colors in here, right? This is all about customer feedback, and, and this is about what we've built for our customers, right? So uh, as you'll see here, you know, all, all the way from the bottom of this stack from the NFVI architecture, from, from the NFVI platform, all the way to the telemetry. This is all about optimization and feeding back into the system so you can allow and afford your customers that level of automation and operational efficiency. So again, with that, if there's any questions and answers, I mean questions, then we'll be glad to answer them. But if not, um, thank you for attending. And uh, let's go have, get some drinks. <laughs> so any questions? <laughs> any questions? Uh, if you can, uh, Kyle. Oh, actually, no, Kyle, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, when you're thinking about the, the video, if, you're, if you want to be able to take a video and, and go to another network, where do you, where does that handoff happen, right? I mean, or is there advanced information? Say, let's say if you're watching something on Netflix on your TV, and it's like I'm leaving, well, I'm watching my phone. Um, where does the placeholder happen? It says, yeah. hey, you left this. Yeah, so um, well, let me repeat the question. So when, as you're handing off um, Netflix from one place to another. Or whatever, whatever video. Yeah, or, or any, any provider, really, that's an example. You're handing off from your fixed broadband to mobile. Where does the information get stored that allows you to do the handoff? And really, there are multiple layers of handoff because, sure, the network handoff, the network handoff happens when you, uh, when you can't reach one network and you start going over the another network. The problem is to start streaming on another network and to have the video itself be delivered as opposed to just the packet stream be delivered, the video um, needs, needs to be a lot more bandwidth needs to be available and a lot more content, a lot more uh, data needs to be available to show an entire frame. So what happens is you typically get a gap so to solve that, there are a number of ways that have been solved, that have solved that. I mean, one way is, is just always keeping a certain amount of buffer in the client so that when that buffer drains, by the time the buffer drains, you, you, you're on the new network and you assume that you can hand off, right? That's a simplistic way, but um, more and more, you're starting to see um, uh, more intelligent solutions like um, if the performance, or we're like keeping track of multiple networks at the same time, if the performance of one starting to degrade, start ramping up the other one, um, things like that. So there are a lot of different uh, up, uh, ways in which that's being done. It's already being done successfully um, in phone calls. So uh, for example, AT&T worked with Apple on the Wi-Fi calling. And uh, that, that works pretty well. I know because I have really bad uh, LTE service in my house. So it almost always shows the Wi-Fi indicator <laughs> when I'm at home. And, you know, that's, uh, and it works really well. So uh, can we get to that for video? Well, to get to it for video is going to be tougher because it's not just two companies working together, you know, big service provider, big device manufacturer and saying, okay, well, we'll make it work between us and that'll cover almost everyone. 
it's really going to have to be an industry effort um, with multiple uh, multiple players at each at each layer. So, but I, I think it's it's something worth doing. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Wrapping up.